Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to the School of Body Language in Public Speaking. Today, we're having our project in progress, how to approach, how to engage, how to behave in international global audiences. Uh, this channel is uh, public speak for public speakers, for coaches, mentors, and uh, academics, people that they communicate, they engage, they are coming in contact uh, with international students, international audiences, and we have started this project um, in order to help and support people to how to engage, how to come in contact better, to gain trust and people to understand them better within their communication. Today with us, we are having, we are having Mr. Jorge Carrillo. I will say a few, very few from the many things from his uh, bio. And uh, Mr. Jorge Carrillo, he's a Holy Grail Method facilitator and coordinate week long retreats for people to work on trauma, coaching, relationships, leadership, risk management education and or any personal or group requirement needed. His role is to guide clients throughout their mindscapes in order to address mental and health conditions, integral development, learning difficulties and neurodiversity, as well to coaching leadership, team buildings, organizational change and intelligence and security processes. Hello, welcome Jorge with us. Hello, good afternoon. Uh in Greece. Good morning in Mexico and good day everywhere else in the world. I'm honored to be here again. Thank you very oh, much. That's great that uh, we are having you with us, uh, your uh, dedicated time and knowledge and experience. And let's stay with the experience. What do I mean? You have a global international medal and coach. You have a facilitator to corporate, international and, go and global corporate uh, businesses. So intercultural communication, intercultural, intercultural seminars and webinars and ways to approach people is something that um, you own, you got the experience. So we need now the feedback. We need all this knowledge or some tips in order to understand which ways you use, what is uh, the things that you are thinking about when you say that now I'm going to design a global international webinar or I'm going to design something for people that, that they are not Mexicans? Well, it's always challenging to address uh, an audience regardless of their nationality. It is interesting because in every audience we will have samples of different groups of people, whether it is because of their age, whether it is of their background, professional background, cultural background. Also, being able to understand these nuances when facing a public audience, it's always an interesting challenge. When it comes to a broader audience, like international audience, well, it, the challenge it stay, takes a, another turn, and it's certainly a, a very interesting way to, to develop one's skills. Mostly in my experience of observation, we usually tend to be very focused on how we are going to say what we are going to say. And uh, it's very important to pay attention on the audience. So one of my key uh, skills or, or strategies is to be very mindful of what is it that the audience is telling me about, because that allows me to, to arrange my wordings, to arrange my, my posture, my, my body language, in order to connect with the audiences as well. I'm not sure how, how informed is the, the, the audience today in so many, so many tools and techniques that we can use for, for body language, for communication, effective communication. And certainly as a public speaker, using those skills are always uh, the first uh, tool at hand. Then it would be to understand the cultural aspects of the audience in order to to have them engage with one's, uh, particularly with the personality before the, the content. No? Usually people are mostly uh, driven to connect with the person. Of course, there is a, a an underlying interest in the subject, but certainly the, 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 the charisma, the charm, the, the magnetic personality one has to to embody, not to project, to embody, it's important. that that allows for for a playful presentation where i think it's a, the key element to be engaging no to be playful to be interesting fun okay perfect so let me recap uh, you share many information here but in order people to 
to make a recap to remind them so you observe you pay attention at the um, audience you are mindful about your audience you are paying attention to your body language how you are communicate non-verbally and uh, you study the culture a lot of things about the specific culture of the audience that uh, you are going to connect so before during the planning process you study uh, of course the subject you share with us that the subjects plays a role in parallel the charisma the embodiment of the um, of the speaker, how uh, the speaker will embody all the charisma and all this communication and the connection. And uh, one uh, tip, trick uh, and uh, communication, it is just to enjoy, to relax, to be playful and interesting with your audience. And this applies um, to international audience as well and uh, to Mexican audience or not. What about the Mexican audience? What is happening over there? Oh, certainly, it does apply. And and when when speaking about Mexican culture, there is a well, there is a range of things that can happen when you are engaging to the Mexican culture. I I think first that uh, let me share a little bit about the Mexicans because it's important to understand Mexico. Mexico, as as many countries who have a, a we have rooted a very ancient culture. And over that, on top of that cultural uh, reality, we have the the another cultural aspect, which is the cultural aspect from the Latin culture, the one that was brought by the Spanish when they came to Americas and 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 conquered the the, the, the ancient cultures. No, so we have to understand that Mexicans have this. Um, complexity because of that upbringing. And it is interesting to be able to navigate through these nuances. Uh, Mexicans by nature, whether it is because our ancient roots or our Latin roots as well, which is uh, hot blooded, we are at the end, we are close to the tropics. Uh, emotions run deep in Mexican culture. So uh, to connect that emotion and the level, it's important in any culture, but with Mexican cities, uh, I would say not only important, but quite easy because we have our emotions very, very, let's say, uh, easy to, to, to connect with them. So one has to be mindful that Mexicans have an, an emotional response to things which is very appropriate if we're going to connect with the Mexican audience. That would be an interesting aspect to, to, to consider. There is another aspect which depends on what kind of subject you are going to speak about. There are complex subjects which demand to be translated into a very simple language in Mexican uh, culture. Why is it? Because uh, Mexico uh, as a general culture, uh, it's not very well informed in many subjects. So we need to make knowledge uh, easy in order for people to, to grasp the key ideas and these key ideas can be grabbed in uh, several, uh, how would I say, strategies of communication with Mexicans. There are common places in any culture that we can resource, whether it's Greek culture, American culture, Italian culture. Those, those, uh, uh, those uh, places that we all know about. And for Mexicans, if you speak about family, about food, and about football, you have the audience engaged by default. So sometimes when uh, presenting to a Mexican audience, it, it pays a lot to share a little bit of the, the experience one has as a foreigner, if we're speaking as foreigners, the experience uh, one has in connecting with Mexican culture. Just an anecdote about the, the food, the food experience, maybe a food experience in the street cart, maybe something sophisticated, but really colorful. Of course, the hot spicy uh, meals in Mexico for a foreigner that will get people very triggered with laughs because people are usually very keen on seeing foreigners uh, having an experience with, uh, with the spicy food. <laughs> and and, and this, this way of communicating with Mexicans, are it's, it's very easy, you know? So if we make it easy in this sense, and we are mindful on how to make our message simple, the, the the audience is going to be engaged uh, massively. Then it will come to, to keep the momentum once this engagement happens. No? So along the, along the presentation, 
it keeps uh, to keep uh, relating with anecdotes about the Mexican experience if you are a foreigner speaking in Mexico or if you are speaking with Mexicans uh, elsewhere in the world it's also very uh, very valuable because uh, Mexicans are also very nostalgic when it comes to their place of origins so Mexicans who are in abroad whenever they are remembered of their of their home country they will be very engaging because that brings conversations that comes very deep in the emotional aspects, no? So people people uh, value, pe people cherish these kind of interactions in a presentation. So I think this sets a, an underlying a structure in which one can present more, more uh, confident with more confidence, no? Because we, you've you've breached the audience with these strategies. So once that breach happens, Mexicans won't won't leave the engagement. In that regards, I think we are very loyal to the presenters. Once we are engaged, we we keep engaged because the, there is this family bond. No, it's like now like a friendship. It's a, one of the beautiful things in my country is that people, when they are very open and friendly, uh, friendship comes very honest, very genuine, and certainly with loyalty in in, in place. So creating that effect for a presenter for, for a presentation pays a, pays a lot of dividends. Oh, Jorge, I like it a lot. So we see here, you share a lot of values that people, they connect with their values, like it is the family value, the loyalty. You, you share very um, meaningful words here. You talk about the food, the respect that you have to the family and all this engagement during the table process. And you talk about emotional apply to appeal, emotional appeal to the audience. It's easy, simple, with easy, simple ways. And you have one theme, one uh, topic, your uh, thesis, and then you approach this thesis with different uh, uh, strategies, with different ways and different levels. Maybe you start with the simple level and then slowly, slowly, gradually, you go deeper and deeper to this one uh, thesis that you are having and you are going to present. I like this, the tactics and the strategies that you share with us. It was like it was in front of me. You talk about uh, colorful. You talk about all this vivid um, aesthetic uh, language that you can use when you want to approach Mexicans. Um, and uh, you share with us your information. So it's now for me, I'm ready to speak in front of a Mexican audience. I like that um, you say about uh, the people, how the people they will, when you breathe and they, you overcome the first stage and they trust you, then they are going to be loyal to the end, to the speaker, but the speaker needs to use other anecdotes, to be relaxed, to be friendly, to share. Um, experience that he he had during in his Mexican um, with Mexican people maybe something from history maybe something in real life like uh, the food the tasty food and um, so football family friends open loyalty how many beautiful it is uh, nice that in the beginning you share that there is the ancient roots plus the Latin root that all this uh, creates uh, the personality of the Mexican audience. And you have to feel this and uh, to be aware about uh, uh, this uh, audience. So I like yeah, it a lot. Yes, please, please. There is a, there is a couple of um, important advices, the not to do things, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, we want to... also this, please, not we to do. Know about this. Uh, Mexicans, because of this ancient uh, history we have background, we tend to be um, uh, societal, societally wise. Uh, we are fragmented. And uh, within this fragmentation, it's easy for Mexicans to fall into a polarizing state as well. Just as emotions can be a way to connect in a very deep and meaningful way, if we're not mindful of certain things, we can polarize the audience, which is not bad in essence. Sometimes for a dialogue, for contrasting ideas, polarization, sometimes it's a, it's a, it's useful, sometimes it's needed. Nevertheless, one uh, needs to understand certain boundaries. Mexicans get triggered with certain, uh, certain political conversations. I'm not going to go into politics, but certainly everywhere politics touches a nerve for everyone. But in case of Mexicans, uh, the polarization can be triggered easily. 
if we, if the subject at hand of the presentation does not need to go there, please be mindful not to talk about politics or international <laughs> politics as well. Mexicans are very because again we were conquered by a by a imperialistic uh, country at that time. Uh, we have this uh, unconscious uh, relation between victim and abuser, uh -huh. which is uh, it's interesting because this is like a so so psychological aspect of society. And it's very interesting if we can uh, explore these aspects. Uh, much of value is there, but we need to be very careful. So it's easy for people to have that polarizing persp perspective when talking about politics. So one has to be very careful of where is it that I'm coming from when speaking with politics, because you can one can be speaking about a certain subject from the wrong position, at least from the perspective of the audience. So one has to be very able to to mediate between these polarizing aspects. So just be careful about that. Other than that, the Mexican audience, it's a, it's, it's a lovely audience. It's, it's, it's engaging, it's emotional, uh, it's uh, uh, trustful, no? it, 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 it builds trust. So I think it's, it's easy to present to Mexicans, actually. <laughs> Oh, I like that you also, also you share this uh, great information about politics. So we have to be very aware about this and where we are coming from, and to see all the pot the potential, of course, and the perspective of the audience uh, when we are going to share it, the national politics, or or, or maybe we want to share an an. an uh, uh, maybe an anecdote or that has to be engaged with politics, then it's very polarized and very difficult and maybe <laughs> then we have to, it's difficult to reverse, to take it back. I think if you share it, then it's very difficult to take it back. So we have to be very mindful about this. I like about the society fragmentation and the hierarchy that uh, the respect of uh, hierarchical uh, status they are maybe it's also good to share about that it is uh, i think when we address to the audience when we address to a professor when we address to people that they are with as high society uh, levels uh, it's uh, what style how we address how we say thank you for example it's professor from this university x how we share the titles how it's we're dealing with that this is, this is the part where planning comes in hand. Uh, personally, I am a believer that the planning is not needed when public is speaking. If we are coming from a genuine place, when we are uh, apt and skilled in our subject at hand, no? I think that would give us in any situation the ability to present without planning. But in some cases, the planning needs to be done because maybe the subject at hand, it's a very technical, it demands a thoughtful audience and certain nuances related to the subject at hand. And in that regards, when it comes to this uh, nature of our societal organization with these hierarchical structures quite defined, it, it pays a lot to understand what kind of audience I'm going to present. Where is it that they belong in these hierarchical aspects? Because this is where I can be uh, presenting myself more familiar and relaxed or maybe I need to be very, very um, with a with a conservative uh, demeanor, and more like an academical way, no? Because people tend to be the higher the hierarchy, the mm -hmm. the more serious people are, at least in Mexico. So they expect mm -hmm. to behave with certain standards, social standards that in general are not uh, observed, but in certain aspects they are. So this is where one has to understand, okay, what kind of audience I am going to address. If the audience comes to be from a certain age, these social boundaries are more relaxed. That's the general sense in, in the youth, gen, in the young generations everywhere. So this applies as well in Mexico. So the age uh, demographies in our, in our audience, it's also very, very important. If we're speaking with a, uh, old age uh, audiences, it pays off to be um, conservative, pacing, no? Pacing it's important in any presentation, but here to be mindfully pacing, it's important because people might be a bit slow in catching up with what it is presented. So pacing allows to help the audience to, 
to keep track on the presentation definitely no so that's something that it's uh important to have in mind if i'm speaking to a certain audience the pace i'm going to keep some some people are very energetic very emotional they connect but that sometimes they go too fast for the audience because the audience because of their age they are not uh, well informed about subjects their listening style is a bit more thoughtful because that, that demands to be thought the thoughtfulness or a or for or a, or for a good audience so we need to keep up with the audience and that's an important aspect to be to be aware of before presenting of course and uh, i like that uh, you share about and we have to be um very mindful about the hierarchical uh, aspect and uh, all the um, uh, you share that it depending if it is a higher level then we have to be a little bit more not so in the beginning at least in order to to see how relaxed they are to have this academic this more a little bit conservative way of communicating so that means non-verbally less gestures maybe not so exaggerate of facial expression maybe to go more like medium more rare to be more conservative also with the movement and the hard gestures, I suppose, because this go along a sign together. And you share about the young generation, it's more global and everybody is like, we break the boundaries and we communicate with this conversational and friendly way to all of them. And uh, about, I like the pacing and the slow thing, because uh, in general, let's say that uh, you are coming also to Greece to speak on the, or we are going outside to speak internationally. It is a key word when you are talking to international audience, uh, the pace. This is key uh, to, to speak slowly. Uh, I speak fast normally, this is my style. So it's hard for me to try to, to make me like that, to, uh, to speak a little bit slower. But I know this is a key word uh, that uh, slow to be slow. And um, you said also before, Speak simple. Speaking simple, it's not only for Mexican audience. Uh, for me, it is for everybody because when we are coming from another country and we're going to share with global international people, simplicity and uh, slow, to speak slow in a slow pace, this is two key words for everybody if you want to communicate and it's not your native audience. So they, you have to speak slow. Now, now I slow my pace. <laughs> I did it. I try. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay. okay. There, there, there are many things that happen when presenting, and this is for any audience. Uh, I, 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 I personally, I, my, my presentations are usually not for big audiences. Uh, in general, when I present, the, the, the biggest audience might be probably seventy people, not, not, not hundred people. That's quite unusual. And uh, if, if the time, if the audience, if the if the place where we're presenting allows for direct engagement with some people in the audience, it pays very good dividends as well, because this uh, sends the unconscious message to the audience that you care about them. You want to learn about uh, why is it that they are here? What's the interest in the particular subject at hand? Do they have any questions probably before presenting? And this allows us a presenter to to calibrate the audience as well. Uh, I have a personal, this is an unconscious thing, but I used to do it uh, when I began presenting a, a while ago. And I would uh, watch me on my audience and my first intentionally uh, driven question for myself would be, what does the audience need from this presentation? Unconsciously, if I make myself this question, it allows me to really pay attention on the audience rather than myself. It's very common that speakers, particularly if, if we are beginning to, to present, so we are very in ourselves, no? Am I presenting right? Uh, am I making mistakes? How do I look? No, it's everything, an overload of information about myself. And this question kind of flips completely the perception into what's important, which is the audience. And then I can, I can direct my presentation towards that particular uh, intentionality that I found from the audience. What is it that the audience needs? And my focus is into serving the audience rather than just presenting. It's it's a it's a correlation of forces, let's say, or or, yes. or, or roles. And and if if myself as a presenter can 
can bring this to a balance. The, the inevitably my presentation is going to be engaging because I am responding unconsciously to the need of the others, no? And this allows me to pay more attention to the physical, uh, to the body language of the audience as well. This is very interesting. I'm not sure yourself or your 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 clients or peers uh, how mindful they are about the the body language of the audience. And and you can play with the audience. Yes. When you come which yes. which their body language is close or not interested. You focus your your intentionality towards that person, and when you open that person, suddenly something happens that you can bring people to the fold, to the to the engagement, and it's building a a collective energy, very subtle but very powerful because that feeds back into people as well. And I think a, a top class presenter has to be able to create this effect in the audience, uh, regardless of the subject at hand. Yes. So it, it's having friends, it's meeting people in a place where everybody's interested to meet each other. Exactly. I, oh, Jorge, I like it. Many, many things that you share with us. Let me make a recap. I like the collective uh, energy. Of course, we have to be mindful. And also the questions, also what does the audience need for this to this presentation? Because then you focus your intentionality on this. If you have, you put the intention to your mind. So all comes naturally then because you are focused to the audience. So you you can sense, you can see, you can observe, you can non-verbally take all the insights, what is happening in the energy of the room, and you, you will try your best effort to communicate, to engage, to connect, to be understood, because we want to share a message and it has to be clear and understood. And I also like that you play with the roles and the forces, that there are forces and roles. Let's take to the roles. So it is like uh, we are having as a presenter, there is this role, that the role of the presenter and the role of the audience. How then it is, let's put the hierarchy inside this game and arena. For you, the role of the presenter and the role of the, uh, of the audience, what is in the hierarchical uh, <laughs> ladder? Let's put like that. How, how you, you can see, you can describe to us that the presenter... Uh, got this role and the audience got this role in a hierarchy, hierarchical level? Or I, I would say that uh, although there are hierarchical uh, circumstances in a group of audience, or in an audience, uh, it plays to simplify the roles to a basic uh, paradigm. One which is the person who holds the, um, the knowledge and there is a certain authority on that person. And, and at the end, uh, there is an interesting unconscious aspect in, in presenting. And it is that people connect immediately to, to a younger aspect of themselves in school. Oh. People want to learn, and this is associated to early stages in life. No? There are people that they are still in school and they keep uh, going to conferences, webinars, courses, and they don't stop. It's, it's okay, no, it's part of our development. But and it, invariably, the, the unconscious aspect of people, if we can relate into those paradigms, no, the person who knows has the, not, not the authority of an individual or egoistic authority, but the knowledge, the, the, the authority of knowledge as itself. And allowing the people in the audience to get into this learning state, which is related to a younger stages in life. So the role is more like a, an adult and a kid. Uh, oh. So we need to be in that sense uh, paternal, no? Uh, paternal. Welcoming. It's, it's like a relation like father and son, mother and daughter, mother and son, father and daughter. It's interesting because we all we all operate within unconscious aspects of selves, which are related to previous aspects of our development. So this is the basic uh, role that plays along with a presenter. So I think if if a presenter can bring the audience through their message, message through the engagement uh, abilities, through the knowledge itself, bringing people to that particular uh, stage in life by nature the younger aspects of self are curious and they like to explore. 
if an engaging uh, audience can be brought to that area of, uh, of awareness, you got the best audience because they will be curious about the subject. They will want to explore about the subject. So if you can lead them into that way, one creates a learning experience. It's not a presentation anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a process of evolution. So I think that that is the key element in these uh, different roles that need to be played in an audience. So we need to escape the natural uh, roles of authority or yes. things like that and get into that basic paradigm of a early stage in our life, which is a learning stage, a discovery stage. We have to enable people to do that because, and this is something that from the conventional uh, learning st systems, uh, usually the teachers inhibit that aspect of the of the jungs. Yes. A teacher tells you what to do, what's the right knowledge, when to do it. So the natural aspects of curiosity and discovery and exploration of a child of a of a children are inhibited. A good presentator needs to trigger those aspects of self, so people can have this evolutionary leap into the knowledge they are being uh, presented, they are receiving. It's a it's, magical aspect, but right? it's it's magical. It's magical, and I like because now, as you are mentioning, if we want to to bring the curiosity of the audience and uh, to make them to feel that, like that they have to explore oh, what uh, is happening right now, then that's why we are using this uh, communication tactics like we share like uh, questions, open questions, like uh, rhetorical questions. We do things like uh, uh, you keep it uh, in the beginning a little bit magical or maybe we share a quote that is relevant. We see our people that uh, they have this authority and the knowledge, and we try slowly, slowly to, to open the door to this new aspect, what we are proposing and what we're sharing in front of them. So I like so many things, uh, like uh, the roles. In the beginning, when I share the question, I didn't expect to go so deep and far. Thank you so much, Jorge. I didn't expect to go through and to share to me that uh, Roxani, the speaker, takes the paternal role or takes this role of the and uh, the audience is like the young children that they have we have to make them to remind them the curiosity to remind them and to make them to want to explore all these things and uh Jorge is again with us i'm back uh, yes it was quick <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, this is a hurricane season in Mexico, so we have big thunderstorms from time to time, and uh -huh. that messes the internet. So I'm sorry for the technical failures, but I am back here with my Wi-Fi and my telephone. So uh, ready to. <laughs> yes, beautiful. Uh, Jorge, there is thunderstorm over there. What is the weather? Let's share a little bit. What is the weather like now in Mexico? Well, it depends on which part of Mexico you, you are ah. referring. Mexico has this diverse, uh, there is desert, there is mountain, there is tropical forests, and there is the seaside. So uh, personally, I live in the mountains. Uh, this is weather right now, it's very sunny in the day. Ah. Uh, it must be like uh, 26 degrees. And usually at night, it pours like if you are in, a, in the middle of a, of a hurricane, big storms at night. So the weather is very nice in these regards because it allows for people to do their things in the street every day uh, during the day. At, at night, you are at home, you don't need yeah. to drive traffic jams, uh, which is always uh, some 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 somewhat problematic rain and traffic to don't uh, don't yes. go together. <laughs> Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful. And um, I like I was sharing about the roles that uh, I like the way that you approach the audience from the public speaker to approach the audience uh, and just to think about it, how we will make them feel curious, how we will make them to to open their mind to explore. So we have to maybe to make games, maybe we have to break them to uh, if it is a um, on the internet like that to, to split it in breakout rooms. How to create this interactiveness and creativity of the audience in order to make the mind to want to grab the information and to understand also parallel. So knowledge and entertainment at the same time. I like it a lot. So uh, what is about, 
about your feeling, how this globalization, all these things that is going right now to the society? It's not a political question. <laughs> well, please, please, say, please. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do the psychological, let's, the, the psychological yes, the, perspective of it. Yes, it, please. It is, it is interesting. We've, we've, we're living a challenging times in terms of communication because with the modern technologies, there are two key situations that we have to be mindful and they are they are dangerous i would say the the, the hyper dependency on on technological gadgets now everybody is relying on a telephone no? uh, and the other one which comes together with these technologies is that we are being trained to short spans of attention this is traumatic by, by, by nature and particularly in the younger generations. So being able to bring people to be engaged for long periods of time with young audiences, it's even more challenging because their attention span has been conditioned to the duration of a TikTok video. Oh. And this is terrible because people cannot hold their focus longer times for, for, for deeper thoughts for deeper explorations of, of meaning, of, of, of facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this brings a challenge to the presenter, but socially, it shows something very important. If we don't uh, balance the relation with these gadgets, we are creating a problem for the younger generations when they come to a certain age. Because how can you understand someone who needs to express themselves with depth, with emotion, with length. How do we hold that space when we're talking with someone paying our attention? As a, as a therapist, the approach I, I use is basically to hold the space for people to feel safe and have the proper time to explore their own personal situations. Uh, it's not different when we are communicating with people. If we are a parent, we're holding the space to our children to feel themselves uh, trustworthy and, and, uh, and confident enough to be heard. But what happens when that ability is not there anymore? How, in the future generations, how the parents can hold the space for a younger kids for their kids when they haven't developed those skills when neurologically we're loaded with dopamine looking for the next stimuli and sometimes the stimuli are not positive i might be in a conversation and i can just trigger myself into something which will demand a dopamine hit a dopamine rush but it's not going to take me anywhere so in terms of communication, this is probably the biggest challenge that we have to face. And uh, certainly this allows for conversations on how we best set the environment for learning, for presenting, for dialoguing. No? We have to learn to hold space uh, in different ways. It's interesting when I am presenting people, they, they are eager, anxious. It's an anxiety. They need to reach their telephones, even in a presentation. In a dissertation, I've seen people which they are uh, situations that uh, a lot is depending on paying attention on a particular meeting and, and they, they cannot help themselves. They need to go back to their telephone to see who has what stopped them in the past uh, two minutes. Oh, I see your point. And, and we have to be uh, generally, but if we are presenting uh, different subjects, we can learn a lot of observing these social dynamics. The first and foremost is that uh, it's uh, socially dangerous, no? Mm -hmm. As a presenter, we need to find a way to get people engaged in the sense that the anxiety they have is because they want to learn something from you and not to check their WhatsApp messages in the telephone. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, modern times are complex times. <laughs> yes, I agree. And uh, I like that you mentioned it. So... Because, and I like because you say we have to set the environment first to make them feel that they are heard. So we are leaving all the past um, 
we're taking the good part from the past communication, public speaker, the authority, high-ranking here, the teacher, the top, and then the public, uh, the, the audience. Then now, now this is that was the past. Now, now in days, it comes a little bit. It depends on the culture, but okay, there is some a little bit the authority of the knowledge, not of the person, and then the audience. And now in the future, the meta audience is coming that um, the audience is here and we have to find the public speakers, the academics, the teachers, all the people that they are communicating, they're having audience, the managers, the leaders, they have to find the way. So the audience has to be very careful, the safe environment around them. So maybe now it's time that the leaders, the people first, to make maybe some questions, to make first the audience to, audience to speak, to be heard, maybe with the polls, with conversations, with breakout rooms in the beginning, from the beginning, then to relax, to find this curiosity, to come up the dopamine or all these uh, hormones, and then to start the level and on, at the second part to start the speech. Maybe we have to change the structure of the lecture, of the speech, and to and to leave the audience to understand themselves and to inside uh, the audience to feel more uh, more seen, to feel more uh, that they are individuals separate and also they are having a great dynamic and importance and importance to complete, to connect, to be part of the team of the audience. Maybe we have a little bit to change the perspective, how we approach. And uh, this is uh, our generation that they, we have to start to doing this because you have also young people that uh, we communicate. Uh, oh. it's, a, it's a dynamic situation. And, and certainly when, when one knows the subject at hand, we can release ourselves from the pressure, the stress of not knowing what to say and focus in a playful presentation. Uh, Making people participate always brings people's attention. They, they are, why is it that someone is participating? When it's my turn, maybe I don't want to, and the presenter is going to put the finger on me, and I'm going to be placed in a public situation, and I'm going to blush. And, <laughs> but, but that brings diversity to the conversation, to the, to the presentation. And if the subject allows, why not do it? No, I think that's important. Also, people also... Uh, Validating their experience, it's important because they feel part of whatever is happening. And that's part of making them participate, validate what they have to say, even if we say, even if we think it's not the right thing to be said or it's contrary to what we are presenting. Let's validate, let's explore what is it that this is a, that this is happening. This is a learning opportunity for all. This is why one has to be fully engaging. It's more about the engagement of the presenter with the audience than the audience being engaged with the presenter with the presenter the the person responsible of the communication is the one who emits the communication not the listener yes. it's very interesting when we are uh, this is a dynamic between pa parents and children that the the father says you are not understanding me why do we place the responsibility of being understood to a little children when the parent needs to be skillful enough to make themselves being understood. Yes. Exactly. So the question is, I am explaining it properly because the responsibility of the communication is on me. It is the same when presenting in public audiences. So I need to engage with the audience, not the other way around. <laughs> yes. So we have to know the dynamics, what is coming to see to to see what is coming for the future generations and for our society in order to help and support. This is uh, our part, the people that uh, are they communicate their message and uh, what they are sharing. Uh, I like a lot uh, also about that we are responsible of our communication, so we can keep this uh, here as a little treasure box to have it in front of us and uh, to use this quote uh, whenever we try, we feel stressed that uh, we're having an audience that we don't know the audience and we don't know the culture. So we have to find the ways to see, to research, uh, to talk, to communicate, to make a survey before we go to this audience 
to get more information for me this is the part to get as much information as possible in order to be ready and to know how you are going to open uh, to open the audience to open the mind actually to accept and to understand and digest the knowledge uh, Jorge Carillo thank you for being here maybe I call you once more <laughs> Anytime, I'm always happy to have these uh, presentations. These conversations <laughs> are always uh, very, very, very meaningful and, and, and joyful. So, dear friends, uh, we're having the pleasure uh, today to have uh, Mr. Jorge Carillo with us, a Holy Guard coach. There are also other videos uh, and interviews that uh, we have made together with uh, Jorge. We're having the wiseleaders.com. It's uh, our uh, support to the society for leaders that they are communicate uh, intercultural with other people with their teams so we are here for you to help and support and uh, you can contact us and we are here for you take care and we are wishing you all the best bye all please do please contact us we'll be more than happy to to get to know each other and communicate uh, fluently and, and learn about each other as well. Thank you very much, Roxani, and all the best to your audience. Uh, looking forward for the next next video with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much. <laughs>